It's time now for Harm Reduction. Heard every Tuesday at 7 p.m. with Will Beaton. Cutting Edge Radio, where we'll ask the questions others don't want to ask. Now here's your host, Will Beaton. Hello, everybody. It is Willard T. Belly here, reporting live from the Harm Reduction Report mobile studio in sunny, warm, Grass Valley, California. I am here staying in a friend's house, and I'll be here for the next five weeks. And And I'm really here to learn about harm reduction, or what my friend Annie, whose homestead I am currently occupying, would call risk reduction. We have many conversations about which phrase is better. I am still open to all new ideas. I think I think we agree that constantly trying to find new new phrases to describe what we're doing is important and taking new labels and not not holding too tightly onto anyone but <laughs> harm reduction is the word that and she she thinks uh, risk reduction she likes that better. Whatever it is, I'm here to learn about it. Uh, Annie her name is Annie Oak. And I first ever heard about her because she spoke at the Psychedelic Club uh, National Psychedelic Symposium in Boulder, Colorado a few years ago. Uh, James Casey, who founded the Psychedelic Club, a student organization at the University of Colorado Boulder, he helped organize this big event that the club uh, put on uh, called the Symp- National Psychedelic Symposia. And they had all these great speakers talking about uh, psychedelics and I, I think harm reduction mainly and uh, the things like that and it was really great and uh, Annie Oak gave a talk about uh, her her talk is called harm deduction because uh, she's talking about how she founded the fur the full circle tea house which is uh, a tea house and it, uh, it also is all about harm reduction and uh, at at events, how to uh, running safety crews at events and stuff like that, and a lot more. One thing it does is it goes to Burning Man every year and operates a tea house harm reduction zone at the Burning Man Festival in the desert. Uh, and Annie has experience doing this. So her talk, she was talking about how they set up their tea house at Burning Man and uh, how that's related to harm reduction and how you can bring that as sort of an artistic expression of ways you can live and think with a harm reduction mindset uh, on your normal day-to-day life uh, back home, wherever that may be. Uh, Annie also founded a group called the Women's Visionary Council, which is a 501c3 nonprofit group that organizes community events and does things related to harm reduction and empowering women uh, to be involved in harm reduction uh, and and psychedelic stuff. Uh, One thing they're doing right now is a risk reduction workshop uh, in a couple weeks, actually on April 15th, April 15th, Sunday, uh, in Nevada City, California here, we're organizing this harm reduction workshop. And that's part of the reason, a big part of the reason why I am here in California right now is uh, because I was hired to help organize this event and to film it. So we're making a video of the presentations going on at this event. So that's partly why I'm here. I basically just came a few weeks early so I could stay here on Annie's new homestead up here in the foothills and uh, help her build her garden and help her uh, put up a deer fence and do some stuff on her property with some of her her friends and other roommates, uh, some of whom are people I have met before. And uh, that's why I'm here. (laughs) It's making me want to explain. I feel a little nasally. Uh, Ever since I got to California a couple days ago, the weather has just been really, really amazing. Like, wow. (laughs) Everything is so green. And and so warm and no bugs and wow, it's really nice. Uh, but one thing I've noticed is that I guess allergies or something. But my nose is super, <laughs> super clogged up now, and it's bothering me. And forgive me the few uh, coughs that are bound to appear in this audio stream. Uh, here I am. I'm sitting here. What what I'd like to do for this uh, rest of the this hour is sort of 
uh, explain a little bit more about why I'm here and, and what it is I'm going on, I'm, I'm noticing that's going on, uh, what we'll do for the next few weeks while I'm out here in regards to the show. And I also just want to explain a little bit of the history as I understand it, which is in a limited sense, you know, I'm, I'm learning about most of the stuff that I'll be talking about here. So um, if I if I don't qualify it enough, I, I really ought to that the stuff I'm talking about, <laughs> this is just my impression of it. And uh, but it's all very, very interesting. And I am trying to explain it in the form I know, uh, simply to figure out what I don't know. And uh, get an impression of how limited my perspective really is so that we could figure out how to widen it further. Um, first, I'd just like to explain a little bit more about where I am right now. So this is really interesting. Uh, Grass Valley, California is uh, really close to Nevada City, California. They're sort of, in my impression, sister cities. Um, from what I have been told, there is a really interesting sort of mix of uh, people with different perspectives. And if you had to lump it up in a sort of primitive way, um, somebody might summarize it as saying, there are uh, hippie folk and there are other towny folk who are <laughs> who feel differently than the hippie folk about certain things. Um, and down from what I was told, downtown Nevada city is like a place where the hippie folk are. Uh, the rest of Nevada city is a lot of conservative, uh, gated communities, older, older communities. Um, grass Valley, as somebody said, it was sort of the opposite, uh, the outer edges of it and the homesteads around there are sort of more hippie folk and <laughs> closer to the center of grass Valley is more normal suburban, uh, older Towny folk, and uh, forgive these very coarse uh, labels and stuff, but this is just what I was told, and it's sort of what I'm getting an impression of. I don't know, wanting to learn more about. Uh, it's a very interesting place. Last night I went to something called Ecstatic Dance in Nevada City, and it's this really wonderful. Uh, it's like a dance party, except in most of the rooms you don't speak. You just you just dance and you don't talk to each other. But it's not uh, in a closed off kind of way. It's just is like a sort of an experimental way, like how to interact with people without talking to them. And then of course there's a tea house in the other room where you can sit down and talk, and it's really fun and really wonderful. And it was just great to see all the all the weird people, <laughs> and I was one of the weird people dancing away at this funny uh, event. And I had a wonderful time. I, I volunteered so I didn't have to pay even, and it was just fun. And then afterwards, everybody goes to this place, uh, Elixar, to the tea, tea house and fun, sort of like a bar, but it's like tea. It's, it's hard to explain. You know, it's, it's so funny. I was trying to uh, wrap my North Dakota mind around a place like this and, and like an event, like the dance thing we were just at. And it was all very interesting. And I realized that uh, I'm going to learn more the uh, more I, I hang out with people here. And I'm looking forward to doing that. Uh, Annie, uh, her homestead here uh, is uh, in, in technically in Grass Valley. Um, uh, so Annie, Annie's a, a science journalist, and, and she's also uh, – she was the main editor of this book called The Manual of Psychedelic Support – which maps, say it with me, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, which is the parent company of the Psychedelic Club and uh, the UND Psychedelic Club. Um, Annie edited this book that MAPS published, uh, Psychedelic Support Manual, and it, it's sort of one of the main canons. It, it's, a, it's a really important work because it, it brings together a ton of the top people from these different harm reduction and medical science uh, fields to really put together a wonderful guide explaining, like in the back, there's a lot of these appendices about the, the effects of certain substances, uh, drugs that people are using, you know, and, and uh, there's even pages of different names, code names for drugs from different countries. And uh, that's just one example. There's a ton of really important scientifically backed up 
information in this in this manual. And Annie was really involved in its production because she is really active in this whole community, and she's one of these great people everybody seems to look up to. Or I don't know about everybody. I, sh- I shouldn't say that, but <laughs> I, I a lot of people seem to look up to her, and, and uh, I'm happy to be her friend. And so I'm, I'm occupying a trailer in front of her house <laughs> out on the homestead for a few weeks, uh, helping her build her up upper homestead here and I'm, I'm bringing all this up because i want to explain her project because it's very interesting and i think it's totally relevant to the uh, harm reduction conversations that we have back home in grand forks good old g funk uh, the conversation uh, so a couple of andy's housemates here are carrie and sage they're about my age maybe a little older i'm not sure they grew up around here and uh, Carrie was just giving me a lot of this great perspective, uh, some some background, some history on, on this town and the dynamics of people in Grass Valley, Nevada City. Um, one thing that California uh, here north is known for is growing marijuana. And so, and also, uh, just this year, California legalized marijuana. Uh, so, wow. There's going to be recreational marijuana dispensaries soon, or I think there already are, and uh, in in some places in California at least. And it's all very interesting because this homestead that we have purchased here, well, that that, that Annie purchased uh, about less than a year ago, uh, she's been renovating it and uh, cleaning it up and stuff. The place she bought here. Well, it used to be a, a very small marijuana operation. People people here were growing a little bit of marijuana. And uh, what she's doing is now, now she's, since she's bought it there, she's not growing marijuana here. And she's working on a writing project, sort of describing this process of turning a marijuana farm back into a family farm. And uh, with a garden, you know, just to support the homestead and no marijuana. And so part of what I'm doing here these few weeks is helping her build her garden. And so uh, we're totally um, uh, chopping up the garden space back there. And we're going to be doing this layered sort of permaculturing stuff and trying to build up some soil beds and bringing in some compost and manure and all this fun stuff. And... I mean, she's she's converting her garden from a marijuana farm back into this thing. And, and it's very interesting because uh, a large part of the local economy here in Grass Valley, Nevada City, or at least, okay, I don't know about large. This is, again, my impression. Uh, a significant portion of the local economy is, is, is definitely because of the marijuana growing that it goes on around around this county and around here. Uh, I'm learning that there's tons of people who travel here. It's it's this wonderful, I mean, wonderful just in the fact that it's so surprising and interesting to me when I was first hearing about it. There's this concept of trimigrants. Uh, it's it's you know immigrants for people who are trimming marijuana. So in the marijuana growing process, you you have a part of the process where you trim the plants and harvest the the marijuana off the plants. And so large operations have to hire uh, trimmers. And so people from tons of different countries and from all over the all over the world uh, who who just go from marijuana farm to marijuana farm trimming for people and make a living doing that. And uh, the, I guess it seems that a lot of people who grow marijuana here, uh, they you know also have businesses here, and, and, and their businesses are supported by people who make their living growing marijuana around here and, and stuff. So it's very interesting. And what's so interesting about it actually is the fact that just this year, California legalized marijuana. And Carrie, who grew up here, was explaining to me that a lot of people saw this coming. And so for the last few years, especially this year, um, all of these small operation growers who were mom and pop marijuana growers, farmers, marijuana farmers, uh, 
are closing down and are and are being forced to shut their businesses down because they can't afford to compete with the massive grow operations that are now legally occurring. Um, because of the legalization, big companies have taken over the the industry, the market already, and and just their prices have totally dropped. Prices have totally dropped, so that's why um, the local farmers are going out of business, and all the trimmigrants are running out of work. And there's going to be many economic ramifications. There already have been for the towns of Grass Valley and Nevada City, and probably lots of other places around here uh, for that reason. And it's very interesting, and I'm learning uh, a bit about it. Especially one thing I find interesting is that uh, Kerry said that uh, people who use and or grow marijuana, uh, they're not just the more liberal-sided people, um, that they are also the older conservative folks. Many of them, or at least some of them, uh, though being, you know, conservative, uh, sort of in a traditional older person <laughs> sense. Um, yeah, I don't mean, I don't mean older person sense, uh, forgive me. What, uh, maybe, you know, I mean, I guess, uh, in a rural sort of sense, um, they still, some of them are okay with marijuana. So what's very interesting is, to me is that this division Marijuana sort of uh, divides it or, or brings it together, I guess, however you look at it. It makes me think about how these dynamics work back home in Grand Forks. And again, it brings me back to the concept of tone and how can everybody speak with the best tone that would result in people coming together on these issues, no matter what your normal political stance is on other things. And so tone is on my mind. Um, you know, I would like to take a take a trip down history lane real quick and just explain a little more feelings I've had about being in San Francisco recently and being here nearby in uh, Northern California. Uh, I wonder. Well, <laughs> there is there is a holiday coming up soon, which coincides with a very interesting. Grand Forks holiday, uh, April 19th. Who knows what I'm about to say? <laughs> uh, well, the Grand Forks holiday on April 19th, of course, is Evacuation Day. This is in 1997, the very morning when the town was totally evacuated and because of the flood and everybody was told to leave. And it was the largest mass evacuation of U.S. citizens since the Civil War. And remained so until 9-11. Very interesting. Uh, I think we should have a party on Evacuation Day, April 19th. Let's uh, get your Evacuation Day parties going, G-Funkers. I will not be there to experience it this year because I will be here. Uh, but actually, what I think what I'm going to do is I think I'm going to be in San Francisco on April 19th to celebrate a different holiday, uh, to, to recognize a different holiday. <laughs> uh, it's called Bicycle Day. This, if you don't know the story, uh, is a very, it's a very funny story, <laughs> I guess. It, it just, it re remembers April 19th, it's called Bicycle Day, remembering um, the very day that Dr. Albert Hoffman of Switzerland uh, synthesized and accidentally dosed himself with LSD for the very first time in the history of the planet. Um, he and then rode his bike home, <laughs> and so basically he was in the lab doing stuff with chemicals, and he accidentally dosed himself with this stuff. I guess he knew it was LSD, but he didn't know what it you know what it was going to do to him. He got on his hands at work or something, and then. He's riding his bike home that day, and he starts tripping for the first time. And and he, I haven't read his book or, or his stuff on it, but there's so much to read, and I, it's, I'm going to now because I'm so fascinated by all of this history stuff. But what happened to him, like basically, was that 
he, you know, I was yeah, freaked out, like <laughs> wondering what's happening. He got home and he wrote about it and he, and he tried to figure it out. But then a couple of days later, he, he definitely figured out that it was the LSD that gave him that uh, wild mental trip. And so a few days later, he, on April 19th, 1945, I think, 43 maybe. Uh, he, or maybe it's 49. I'm not sure. <laughs> 1949. Uh, he purposefully dosed himself with, with LSD just a few days after his first accidental trip. And that is the day that is remembered now as Bicycle Day. And so especially the, the main festivities of Bicycle Day occur in san francisco that is the center of it uh basically because it's so funny i guess I, i'm curious as to how the discovery of lsd from this dude in switzerland resulted in all of this energy so far away in san francisco california where the hippie scene was totally born and a huge part of the hippie scene was the use of psychedelics and especially lsd and I, you know, was just in the Golden Gate Park. Uh, I was there a while ago, uh, and I, I learned there was a there was a museum exhibit at the De Young Fine Art Museum about the fiftieth. It was the fiftieth anniversary of the Summer of Love, nineteen sixty seven, and <laughs> I uh, walked through this museum and saw all these pictures. Of, of all these events that occurred in Golden Gate Park in San Francisco, which for the record, as I have to say, because my Uber driver told me I have to tell everyone I can, that the San Francisco Golden Gate Park is marginally larger than New York Central Park uh, because the designer wanted people to be able to say after the fact that it was indeed marginally larger than Central Park. So fun fact. Uh, these pictures I saw of all these massive concerts and gatherings, thousands of these hippie people all over the hills uh, dancing and doing their doing their wild thing. And and these great musicians like the Grateful Dead and, and everyone else, J.S. Joplin, playing to huge crowds of people here. Uh, really, really amazing uh, story, I guess, because they really thought they were going to change the world. And though... It didn't happen the way the most idealistic of them might have thought. They definitely did change the world, and they definitely did change the country. And they, these people, were involved in uh, Supreme Court cases about free speech and stuff. You know, like uh, this all in, impacted the nation and the country in many, many crazy ways, and it still is. And I, uh, it's very interesting. Uh, so what did, what did all of this happen? Well, another another person, another name that I'm I'm just learning about is uh, one called Alexander Shulgin, uh, Sasha Shulgin. This is a man who I was a chemist and like a very fancy, and well appointed person. You should totally look him up on YouTube, Wikipedia, all this. Alexander Shulgin, he was one of the people who designed and first synthesized a whole bunch of psychedelic substances. Um, I guess, you know, the, the information between 1949 and when he started doing his thing, I believe, in the 60s, maybe a little earlier. See, there's so many books on this. Like, I know all my other psychedelic club friends who know all these people. I'm, like, getting the dates wrong and, like, getting the... The discoveries, the orders of it all wrong, and they're probably just like, dude, you know. <laughs> they're probably very annoyed with me. Just the fact that I'm sort of new to all this again. The Shulgin dude, what I can tell you is that he is very highly regarded in this community. And uh, the, his Wikipedia says that he is considered the godfather of psychedelics, which seems to me a very dramatic title that's may be well fitting of such a dramatic uh, personality that this guy seems to be uh, I'm learning about him. Um, he designed a whole bunch of new psychedelic drugs. Basically he, he says it, you can listen to videos of him saying it. Um, 
he took this LSD and he wondered, well, if you change the chemicals and if the, if the compounds are different, what effects is this going to have? And can we as humans learn more about how to experience more things in our mind by, by doing, by doing this? But you know, the fun thing about that is somebody has got to test these things for the very first time. And that's what he did. He did it to himself and to his friends and uh, his close friends. You know, they designed these psychedelic substances and they tested them out and they took really wonderful scientific data information about it all and they are being very uh, analytical about it and they made a whole series of i mean hundreds of scientific papers and stuff about these substances and what they do to you and uh it's a whole wealth of information and before that point nobody did this because you know well, it's weird. Uh, LSD wasn't even made illegal until the 60s. So I, I'm so fascinated to learn more about that. Um, because since then, since the illegalization of these substances in the 60s, there's been very little possibility for people to research them in a above-ground scientific way because it's illegal to possess these things. And you have to go through all these permit processes and most people can't even do it. Uh, so my biology professors at UND were joking about the fact that they can order cocaine to study other zebra fish far easier than any of them could have a time ordering a little bit of marijuana to do a research study uh, involving that somehow, <laughs> which I think is just funny. But... He was this, uh, Alexander Shulgin was this uh, underground dude who just decided to do it. And I just want to read one uh, one or two of these quotes of his that I'm seeing right here. Here's one thing he wrote. How long will this last, this delicious feeling of being alive, of having penetrated the veil which hides beauty and the wonders of celestial vistas? It doesn't matter as there can be nothing but gratitude for even a glimpse of what exists for those who become open to it. That's really interesting. And uh, I guess as I say it, I realize it sort of <laughs> goes into the next thing I want to say about tone and whatnot. I'm very curious to learn about this guy and read more of his books. And I have a feeling that he's very sincere in all of his scientific collecting and all of his the videos that I've seen of him. And um, for a second there uh, he almost sounds like for those of us who try psychedelics we are suddenly enlightened into this new magical world and we see better than everyone else and we are these egotistical self-righteous weirdos who think we're better than everyone because we have seen beyond the veil or whatever I actually don't think that was the tone of that passage I just read I think it was really uh, I think he's being really sincere about you know you gotta become open to things in order to experience them. Uh, that sort of cynical tone that I just described may be attributed to other people. And so I've got to do so much more research on all this. Some people told me that Timothy Leary, um, he also has, a, he was a you know Harvard scientist, doctor guy, I think. I think. Here's one thing he said. This is Timothy Leary. We have always urged people, don't take LSD unless you are very well prepared unless you are specifically prepared to go out of your mind. Don't take it uh, unless you have someone that's very experienced with you to guide you through it. And don't take it unless you are ready to have your perspective on yourself and your life radically changed. Because you're going to be a different person, and you should be ready to face this possibility. Uh, so in that, he sounds like very pretty, pretty sincere, you know, like... But I also thought he wasn't... Well, okay, I won't say that it was he. Other people, including the Grateful Dead, who were a band that everyone loves very, very much, who were sort of at the middle of this psychedelic revolution, hippie revolution. Uh, the Grateful Dead would dose people with LSD without their knowledge all the time. Um, one story was they dosed... Uh, they had like 200 actors were hired to be in a music video that they were making. And they, the band, dosed the punch with LSD and got all of the actors tripping on, on LSD without their knowledge. And obviously, you know, with in a situation like that, 
as Timothy Leary was just saying, you are you're not giving people the chance to be prepared at all to undergo an LSD trip. Um, so that's sort of a different tone. If you're trying to, well, who knows what the Grateful Dead were trying to do in that story, but <laughs> I I don't know. They probably enjoyed themselves for doing it. I don't know. Timothy Leary was arrested uh, for for using or for selling LSD or for just being involved in it somehow. There's see. There's such a story behind all of him, and I've read only a little bit about it. Um, but you may have heard the turn on, tune in, drop out uh, thing, or the think for yourself and question authority are two quotes attributed to Timothy Leary. Uh, one person I'll, I want to mention who is on his Wikipedia page described as the Timothy Leary of the 90s is somebody named Terrence McKenna who was American dude who ended up sort of being based, I think, or living or at least working for a long time or a while in and around San Francisco and Big Sur and this, I think, Northern California area, but especially San Francisco. He was involved in these people. He's, he's called uh, the Timothy Leary of the 90s. I wonder what that means exactly. I wonder what you would classify all these people's tone as. Part of me was under the impression that Timothy Leary is sort of attributed to, and in the end, having a bad tone with talking about these psychedelic stuff. He, I think, ended up getting to be that cynical voice of self-righteousness saying, we are the only ones who have seen the light and know what to do, and everyone else is living in the dark or something, and being a little self-righteous about it, and then being singled out by the opposition and being used sort of as a scapegoat or sort of uh, to wrongly used to describe the entire psychedelic community or people who are interested in sensibly reforming drug policies and stuff. And I guess I thought his, his presence in it may have made things harder. Um, I need to read more about all of this to know and come with up with my own in, in interpretation of it all but either way it's for sure that all these different voices some of them are like that and some of them are not uh, uh, alan watts who's another philosopher guy who lived in san francisco um i think has a wonderfully sincere tone and if you listen to anything alan watts says on youtube uh, he's this old uh, he died in the early 70s um, i think he's got a really good tone when he, when he speaks you can See for yourself. Google Alan Watts. Another one to Google is, yeah, this guy, Terrence McKenna, uh, who uh, I, I don't know how to describe his tone exactly, but it is for sure interesting. I'm going to do my best to play you a one-minute clip. Um, this is just going to be a weird example of what Terrence McKenna says, probably an unfair example if I'm trying to actually inform you at all on what he is like because this is just such a wacky passage but i want to play this passage because uh, this is the trailer for a movie called the uh, imaginatrix the terence mckenna experience which is made by a new friend of mine ken adams i'll describe who ken is but first i'm going to see if we can play this clip i'm speaking to you from the imaginatrix a domain outside of space and time, a domain unknown to ordinary people. But over the centuries, exceptional human beings have learned the secret of moving between the worlds. The Imaginatrix is the land of all dreams fulfilled. It's larger than you can imagine. It's a universe inside the human mind, and it's where the future is going. It is where our destiny lies, in a place where realities are made of thoughts, and where the only laws are the laws of the human imagination. This is the place that shamans have known of for millennia. They pass through the portals that normally are reserved for the dead souls, moving between the worlds. There's a technology 
and an understanding that you can barely imagine. This is what has been kept from ordinary mankind for millennia. This is the real secret behind the idea of magic. This is the universe into which your entire world is destined to dissolve. Yeah, we are. Wow. <laughs> so I'm not sure what I'm asking you to make of that. But <laughs> I it does indeed make me want to watch the full movie. Um this guy, Ken Adams, I I first heard of him uh, watching a talk. If you Google Palenque Norte, it's a series of videos that was made in 2012, maybe other years too, from Burning Man, and it's like a speakers and stuff. Annie Oak gave a presentation at this Palenque Norte series at Burning Man. And you can watch her video on that, uh, what, what she gave back in 2012 on that. And another talk was this guy ken adams talking about making this movie terrence mckenna so terrence mckenna is a also highly educated dude who wrote a bunch of books and stuff and, and gave a bunch of talks and was also a performance artist and a poet and uh terrence mckenna he uh has a lot of stuff you, yeah, you google him there's so much so um one of his friends is my my new friend this guy who made is making this documentary uh, ken Ken Adams and Ken and I were at this uh, ecstatic dance thing with some of our other friends last night in Nevada City and he was explaining to me a bit more of the history and one person we'll be seeing together uh, I believe in a couple weeks at this risk reduction event that both Ken and I will be filming at this risk reduction event that Annie's Women's Visionary Council is organizing in Nevada City is a friend of ours named Emmanuel Sferios. Emmanuel is the founder of Dance Safe, which is an organization that does a lot of good, good harm reduction work. They, for one, create or distribute these uh, substance testing kits. So this is where, say, you are buying MDMA and you're using it, you want to make sure that it really is MDMA. You use this testing kit. You just sprinkle a little bit of your stuff in a, in a tube or in a, a ceramic plate or something. Add a drop of this reagent liquid. Your substance will fizz and change colors. And that gives you an indication of what it truly is. Whether it is what the person you bought it, who, who you bought it from, it is what they said or something else. Uh, this is this dance safe. They uh, do a lot of education about these substance testing kits and about other festival harm reduction or just day-to-day -day life harm reduction and drug policy stuff. Very cool. Uh, Emmanuel, he is also spearheading this movie. He's making this movie called, I think it's called MDMA the Movie. <laughs> it's about MDMA, which is uh, Molly or... Often when MDMA is cut with other amphetamines, it's referred to as ecstasy. Uh, but MDMA, uh, he's making this movie uh, because MDMA is often something that people want to get tested with substance testing kits because MDMA is being cut with many, many other things that can kill you and that have killed people that I grew up with in Grand Forks. And this movie is very educational and it's going to prevent more things like that happening so it's really good and it tells a story of uh well there's so much to the story of mdma beginning from when how it was first synthesized by mr alexander sasha shulgin um well actually mdma was first made in 1912 in uh, like germany or something i think and but in the, I'm not exactly sure when, in 76, yeah, in 1976, Alexander Shulgin figured this out, you know, he found this in the scientific literature and, and made it himself in his lab out on his farm near Lafayette, California. 
northeast of San Francisco, up in the foothills. And <laughs> he created it for the for you know created it again, and he introduced it to a bunch of psychologists in the San Francisco Bay Area, who took to this MDMA, and when they could before it was made illegal, they were using it with beginning to do some research into using it for traumatic uh, experiences for for healing victims of traumatic experiences cut to today you have maps which uh just last year when i went to their the maps psychedelic science conference in oakland the san francisco area last year that was to mark maps finally moving into phase three clinical trials for using mdma as a legal medicine that doctors across the country could eventually soon be able to prescribe mdma treatment to patients of treatment resistant ptsd Uh, so it's totally working Uh, phases one and two have shown indeed that this mdma which was reintroduced to the world by mr shulgin can indeed be used to cure people of ptsd and to treat ptsd and other things like that so i was chatting with emmanuel on easter the other day that about about his movie and about how he's making it and what he's doing and He's still raising money, and he's got a lot of work to do, and he's hired a team, and he's making progress, and uh, it's really cool. And it's telling the story of MAPS, which is the uh, sponsor of the Unity Psychedelic Club, and the in so in part this program here, the Harm Reduction Report. So I'm curious to see how it goes. Um, one person on the board of MAPS is this guy, John Gilmore, who is one of my new friends now since coming to California. I, uh, he's a friend of Annie's. I stayed at his place when I got here, um, when I arrived to San Francisco, uh, the other day from Minneapolis. I stayed with John and this weekend, uh, Ken Adams, the filmmaker and I are gonna go back and stay at John's house next weekend. So John founded, also founded this group called the Electronic Frontier Foundation, the EFF, which is a very important, wonderful organization uh, affiliated with the Internet Archive in San Francisco. Um, another, a very close friend of John's was a man named John Perry Barlow. John Perry Barlow founded the EFF with uh, my new friend John Gilmore. And actually, John Barlow spent the last chapter of his life living in Gilmore's uh, apartment in San Francisco as he fell ill and as he died. He died in Gilmore's apartment uh, where I stayed the other night. Um, Barlow died just in February, just last last month. And um, so now at the Internet Archive, the Electronic Frontier Foundation is organizing a John Perry Barlow Symposium. And so Ken and I are driving to stay at Gilmore's Place and to attend the, the Barlow event. Um, one thing I wanted to, to read... Uh, I'm I'm trying to explain how these people with the Electronic Frontier Foundation how the see how these friends are see how these people are connected you know the the harm reduction world and the psychedelic research world and this uh, Electronic Frontier Foundation here I, I I was trying to figure out how to understand understand this and communicate it. I found something that John Perry Barlow wrote in 1996 called A Declaration of the Independence of Cyberspace. And I'm just going to read some of it here uh, that you can find on WikiQuote. Um, Mainly I'm reading the bold phases. Actually, I might read some more of it uh, than just the bold pieces. Um, Because it's very nice. It's very interesting. And 
it's think he's talking specifically about internet privacy and stuff but imagine how it applies to people and in the harm reduction world in the underground psychedelic research world um a lot of these themes of freedom and expression and stuff like that seem to kind of go together and maybe that's why that some of some of his well, I'm not sure what it means, but I'd like to read it just because I'm attending this event with Ken next weekend uh, about John Perry Barlow and uh, my friend John Gilmore and these other people are going to be speaking at the event. And so I'm, I'm trying to get my head in the game here. And while I'm in San Francisco, I want my experience here. I want to see how it all relates to harm reduction. And I think I'm going to learn a lot about it at, at this event um, just because here's something... Uh, I read from John Perry Barlow. I'm going to read it now. See what it makes me feel. The Declaration of Independence of Cyberspace. Governments of the industrial world, you weary giants of flesh and steel, I come from cyberspace, the new home of mind. On behalf of the future, I ask you of the past to leave us alone. You are not welcome among us. You have no sovereignty where we gather. We have no elected government, nor are we likely to have one. So I address you with no greater authority than that with which liberty itself always speaks. I declare the global social space we are building to be naturally independent of the tyrannies you seek to impose upon us. You have no moral right to rule us, nor do you possess any methods of enforcement we have true reason to fear." Governments derive their just powers from the consent of the governed. You have neither solicited nor received ours. We did not invite you. You do not know us, nor do you know our world. Cyberspace does not lie within your borders. You claim there are problems among us that you need to solve. You use this claim as an excuse to invade our precincts. Many of these problems don't exist. Where there are real conflicts, where there are wrongs, we will identify them and address them by our means. We are forming our own social contract. This governance will arise according to the conditions of our world, not yours. Our world is different. Cyberspace consists of transactions, relationships, and thought itself, arrayed like a standing wave in the web of our communications. Ours is a world that is both everywhere and nowhere, but it is not where bodies live. We are creating a world that all may enter without privilege or prejudice accorded by race, economic power, military force, or station of birth. We are creating a world where anyone, anywhere, may express his or her beliefs, no matter how singular, without fear of being coerced into silence or conformity. Your legal concepts of property, expression, identity, movement, and context do not apply to us. They are all based on matter, and there is no matter here. <laughs> Your increasingly obsolete information industries would perpetuate themselves by proposing laws in America and elsewhere that claim to own the speech itself throughout the world. These laws would declare ideas to be another industrial product, no more noble than pig iron. In our world, whatever the human mind may create can be reproduced and distributed infinitely at no cost. The global conveyance of thought no longer requires your factories to accomplish. These increasingly hostile and colonial measures place us in the same position as those previous lovers of freedom and self-determination who had to reject the authorities of distant, uninformed powers. We must declare our virtual selves immune to your sovereignty, even as we continue to consent to your rule over our bodies. We will spread ourselves across the planet so that no one can arrest our thoughts." We will create a civilization of the mind in cyberspace. May it be more humane and fair than the world your governments have made before. <laughs> wow, I think that was pretty cool. <clears throat> really exciting. Really dramatic. And uh, I'm totally into it. And, you know, as I'm saying this, I'm realizing that uh, a lot of the language there, you could almost imagine 
Alexander Shulgin saying it, or Timothy Leary, or Terrence McKenna, or Alan Watts uh, talking about how, especially Terrence McKenna, I think, would, would point out that it's really, really quite obscene to think that governments would make it illegal for you to think certain thoughts, to, you know, experiment with psychedelic substance that allows you to tap into a part of your mind that your ancestors knew about that is very special one way or another you know whether you're into it or not you have to admit it's a very special human sort of experience and for a government to say you're not allowed to think that way <clears throat> it seems pretty obvious there's a conflict of interest there at least that there there potential for it i mean what do you government have to gain for me not opening my mind up and thinking for myself or ever questioning authority or questioning my concept of reality. I guess so. <clears throat> Excuse me. Here's John Perry Barlow talking about cyberspace, like right at the time where the internet is first becoming a thing. I was two years old. <laughs> it's like, wow. Uh, what are we going to do about it? What is this cyberspace place? I really like it. How, and basically he's saying a lot of the same things that the psychedelic and drug policy reformers would, would say about, you know, creating a world where we are free to express ourselves uh, no matter how weird or whatever others think us to be. It's important that we have the ability to have these expressions, make these expressions of ourselves. So, interesting. I'm very much looking forward to the event. I'll just show you what else is going on here. Confirmed speakers at this event the, uh, to celebrate the life of John Perry Barlow include Edward Snowden, who is the whistleblower you all know about. I didn't know this is also the president of the of a group called the Freedom of the Press Foundation. Uh, there's other people from the Electronic Frontier Foundation, uh, including its executive director and including uh, John Gilmore and others. There are people from universities from uh, wow this looks really fun and also the daughters of john perry barlow are going to be here speaking and i'm very excited and ken has uh some video of barlow that uh, he had collected for annie's women's visionary council and so ken might play some of his video at the john perry barlow symposium event this weekend too so I have a lot to look forward to and a lot to understand about how it is that these internet privacy rights advocates folk from the Electronic Frontier Foundation and how these folks from the psychedelic research history communities and these other groups, these contemporary groups too, uh, how they all go together and uh, how they support each other in interesting, funny ways – and how it takes place in communities like Grass Valley in Nevada City, California here. I'm very interested. You know, when I was chatting with Carrie today uh, about the history, uh, about the dynamics of the feeling of this town, it made me think a lot about certain small towns back home. Certain things it reminded me of and certain things were like totally, totally different. Uh, obviously, the widespread acceptance of marijuana as a thing here in this now i mean now it's legal in california and it just is the history of this area where people have been growing it for a while it's it's very it's treated very differently than it is in minnesota or especially north dakota and so that's funny for me to be learning about and sort of comparing um just as one example um over the next few weeks, uh, what I'm going to try to do is so I'm on my own here out in California. Uh, your pal Cal, who usually helps me do this harm reduction report, is yeah, in, still in Grand Forks. But he's finishing up school this semester. So for the next few weeks, I'm hoping to uh, talk more with some of these friends. So maybe we'll have an episode with Ken Adams talking about his movie The Terrence McKenna Experience. Um, how he made it, what it was like, uh, how that guy influenced, you know, this whole community, this whole psychedelic harm reduction community that exists. 
Um, maybe we'll have an episode with Kerry chatting with him about his perspective as being a local uh, to this area and telling me about how the marijuana legalization has changed the local economy and for better and worse. Maybe we'll have an episode with Emmanuel Seferios, who lives nearby. We could talk to him about the MDMA, the movie he is making, ask him how that process is going and uh, see how, how it is. And that would be a really fun topic. Um, and yeah he, yeah, he lives nearby, so that's cool. And he's the founder of Dance Safe, so we could talk about that as well. Um, Dance Safe is something we've been talking a lot about before, so now it'd be great to have a chance to interview with him. We'll also definitely be covering the risk reduction workshop that the Women's Visionary Council is putting together on April 15th. Uh, I should know that date because I was just making the flyer for the event. <laughs> And we're getting things ready, and Ken and I will be filming it, so we'll be definitely ready to do that. Let me please tell you a little bit more about that event. Uh, there's going to be three main speakers. The first part of the workshop, it's going to be featuring Dr. Gant Galloway. He is a doctor, and he is the director of the New Leaf Treatment Center here in the Bay Area. And uh, he's going to be explaining how to use naloxone, Narcan, which is the opioid overdose antidote. Very important. The second part of the workshop is going to be with Ethan Currens describing simply, well, essentially how to use a milligram scale. And if you are measuring out small amounts of substances, you want to make very sure that you're measuring out the right amount so you don't overdose yourself. And so... How to accurately measure liquids and powders is uh, harm reduction and will prevent overdose. So he's going to be explaining how to do that. And last, um, Amy Raves of Safer Raving is going to be explaining how to use substance testing kits, reagent testing. So that is really cool. And I also think we're going to get a demonstration about how to use fentanyl testing strips, which is if you have an opioid or something else, you think... It could have fentanyl in it. You check it, make sure it's not. So, yo, we're running out of time now, but uh, I'm in San Francisco. I mean, <laughs> I'm in Cal I'm in California, and I am excited to uh, try to use this uh, perspective. You know, we wonder about this back home. Like, it's hard leaving home sometimes, but you're never going to be able to bring any information back home if you don't go out and find it. So that's what I'm out here trying to do, and we're going to bring stuff back home. So thanks, everybody. Sandbag on.